Welcome back. Let's talk about anger in its many and varied forms, especially irritation, frustration, impatience, which all have this underlying sense of wanting to control. Now, especially for veterans, it can come off as a masculine quality or a leadership quality or a I want to get things done or I'm a goal-oriented person type of feel, but really it comes from this angsty angry, irritated core where we're constantly rough and gruff and that's just how we are and it's tough. For example, as an infantryman, the more often you could be right, uh, the bigger you could be right, the more loud you could be about being right and the greater your achievements, but also the more you are perceived to not care or give a shit about this or that and to drive on and to be able to get things done. All of that mentality seemed to have this underlying tone or theme of anger, irritation. But what people don't understand is that impatience and frustration, while from a leadership to a subordinate can seem like this healthy, positive thing to get things done, really it it dehumanizes that person. And not to be so touchy-feely, but to hit the nail on the head, it can dehumanize them and even disrespect them like they're less than, their time doesn't matter, what they've been trying to do doesn't matter. It dishonors who and what they are and eats away at their their passion, what they want to achieve and, and who, what they think and, and what they feel. It devalues that whole process and it, that especially impatience is a big one. It seems to be this internal self focusing only on myself it seems to be this condescending quality especially impatience for example where i'm getting impatient with this task or that task or this family member or that event where what i want and my goals are being put before everyone and everything else and essentially i am minimizing or devaluing other people places situations to achieve this goal, so I'm going to lash out in this impatience reaction, which is condescending. But taking it back from this more personal perspective of reactionary anger, reactionary frustration or impatience or irritation, many times those negative, emotional, angry reactions are them trying to convince themselves that they're okay, that things are gonna be fine, that they're gonna knock out these tasks or they're going to eventually be successful or that this seemingly huge situation is going to pan out. It's it's going to be okay. It helps. Anger seems to give a person a sense of control. Anger actually isn't a primary emotion. It's a secondary emotion, which one view of it means that a person has to work harder to achieve anger and maintain anger. So therefore, it's not the path of least resistance. So therefore, there must be some big trigger triggering that person to emotionally grasp for anger, hang on to it, and project it outwards because truly it takes a lot of energy emotionally, mentally, and physiologically. So that begs the question, what is this bigger underlying issue? Well, it comes down to either feeling threatened or wanting to control. But again, that wanting to control, if we track that back to its root, it comes down to that person feeling less than, intimidated, or fearful. Something has happened in that person's environment that has led them to question what they're doing or some action has been taken against them that makes their actions be questioned or their statements or their masculinity or their pride or their ego be questioned and what they fall back on is anger and on the face of it it seems like they're trying to convince that person or situation that they're in control that they're okay but really they're trying to convince themselves it's this little inner five-year-old child that's kind of crying and feeling weak that is trying to use this short-term tool of anger, which is a a productive, useful, healthy, helpful tool, or else we wouldn't go for it. But that short-term tool can get us through that short-term, but eventually we need to be looking at more moderate or long-term fixes, which is unpacking these issues so we can see what our options are. And instead of picking these short-term tools that just do a half-ass patch job, that we can choose something more on purpose and not default into these negative systems of thinking, feeling, and being that is anger. And we can go more by design and design how we want our responses to be and not our reactions. And here's the thing, especially in the military or law enforcement or a first responder position or anyone even non-military, non-law enforcement who has that more type A personality, 
if we look at our life like a pie chart and we start with our professional life, that tendency towards anger, anger can be very present and it can be relied on more and more and more. And so that little dot or little piece of seasoning in one piece of pie that is the professional piece of pie can grow to a, a bigger part of the seasoning of the pie and then can actually spill over into the other pieces of pie and anger continues to grow and infect the other pieces of the pie until it has the lion's share of the pie under its control, which then only serves to continue to disconnect that person from situations, from people, from emotional and mental processes. Their mind and emotions become increasingly clouded, and that makes them continue to feel more inferior, more less capable, more less confident, which then triggers them back into more anger, and that, that cycle continues to build and build and build until they're just a walking, talking, angry, crappy piece of pie. Simultaneously, because this person, again, doesn't want to react in anger, especially that anger from profession may get into the personal life and they may realize this issue, but not necessarily rate it as a priority or a significant issue. So they try to avoid things. They begin, as their days turn into weeks, turn into months, turn into years, they begin to collect things that they avoid. And the problem is they do this for long enough their whole life, instead of being something they designed and doing life on purpose and, and enjoying it, it is merely a collection of crap that they avoided. Day by day, moment by moment, the tens of thousands of decisions we make in a day, we just begin collecting things that we avoid. And eventually it's as if we're in this room that is our life, but we've painted ourselves into the corner of it and we can't go anywhere. It limits and suffocates everything. And the problem is the people in our life roam around the room, but the line that they cross that trips us up into anger is this line that's drawn literally in the sand. So it constantly is moving with the wind and the sways of whatever's going on, whatever situation, whatever event, whatever thought we're having, however our sleep was, the food that we eat, all these things are constantly shifting the sand. So sometimes part of the line is far away and our family members only have one quarter of the room to work with so they can't really do much. Their ability to interact with us is very, very limiting. Whereas some days the line is pretty close to us and the the family members or coworkers or whatever can roam about the room at, at will and not much irritates us. The problem is that line doesn't move in a day or a week. That That line can move in a moment, in a split second it can go from being pretty close here to being way back there to where we've painted that other person in our life, our, our family member or whatever, into their corner. And whenever they even breathe on that line, we react with anger, which is very similar to this invisible whip. We begin whipping them with anger to teach them essentially or train them that they can't do or say whatever they did. It's essentially like the old school way of training horses or break, breaking the horse or training dogs, for example, through punishment. Through punishment. They do something that was okay yesterday or even five minutes ago, but then something trips and something shifts internally and we begin attacking them for it. And they wonder, wow, this guy is wild. This guy is crazy. That's how whenever I hear family members talk about their family members, Oh, that's just the way Uncle Joe is or Aunt whoever is. That's just how they are. It's not just how they are. It's how they behaved and habituized themselves to be. And just like they dug that crap asshole, they can also dig themselves out of it. One of the cores of the problem is that a lot of our military training, our police training, and less in the, the firefighter community, but again with the American masculine norms, we can learn and be accultured or even trained to be more programmed to survive than thrive. And the reason is, is because the military, again, or the law enforcement has a tall task. They have to train as many people as they can, as well as they can, as fast as they can. And at least with the military, the average career of a military member is three to six years. So if you view yourself as much as you can, as if you were the entity of the military, encompassing all of the branches, and we look at the civilians that are potential soldiers as units, it doesn't make much sense if you're only going to get three to six years of service out of that unit 
to extensively train them and help them master their mind, ha master their emotions. What you want to do is equip them to provide the widget protocol that they need to provide, whatever military MOS specialty they're in. You give them the very basic, simple tools to put their left foot here, their right foot there, to walk with stuff in the left hand, not the right hand, these very small, minuscule things. So that widget that is the person, the human being, whenever they get to their unit, they can be retrained and redrafted and fit a, a simple blueprint mold. So basic training is the process of training a soldier to be trained at their next unit so they can quickly acclimatize themselves to the culture of that particular unit and how things are run. The problem is, is that that unit is a human being and while that works, I mean, it's effective, you're, you're providing that person with short-term tools but the, the thing is, is once they leave the military, they use those short-term tools over a long-term time because, again, those short-term tools are closely interwoven into American masculine norms. So if, for example, out of 10,000 choices or tendency tendencies a person has, if they were using 150 of them in an anger or irritation response after basic training, after cop training, after serving or, or thinking or idealizing like those groups idealize, even if they're not in the military, not in policing, for example, they, after these training, after these experiences, after living in that culture and aspiring to be, to fit in and to be like that culture, instead of 150 times out of 10,000, they might ramp that up to four or 5,000 times. Every other thought, every other emotion may wind up being shaded or colored with that red anger. Also frequently something that accompanies this is again that collecting things that we avoid which essentially collects things that we disconnect to. So we get into this habituation of avoidance which is disconnection which is rejection and whenever I ask people about their perspectives many times what they're trying to say is that everything is gray it's tinged with red and it's tinged with a little bit of gold, which is just happiness, but not true joy. Happiness is more of a situational byproduct, whereas joy is something that we create and manufacture only internally. But the, the truth is, is that there's mostly gray. It's like, you know, 98% gray with one and a half percent tinged with red and just a little fraction of a percentage of happiness. These are hard truths because, of course, our moms, our dads, our grandparents, our great-grandparents who many times have served in some type of law enforcement or military or that has at least been idealized and popularized, those, those parents, those care providers do not want to think that they're essentially sending their youth to psychological slaughter. And I know that I'm, I'm kind of positioning this, positioning this pretty aggressively, but that is the, the, the truer truth. And that doesn't mean that I'm against military or, or policing. I, I love my military service. But again, their tall task to train as many people as they can, as fast as they can, as well as they can, just has certain byproducts. And this is one of those byproducts. Another reason why these issues go unseen, we are cultured and trained to tie our achievements with self-worth. So as long as we are achieving and advancing, we are seen as worthy so we can kind of buy into the lie that that is a, a good substitute for that truer self-acceptance, accepting other people and accepting life situations. Which is also why these issues many times, that three to six year period of military service for example, a lot of times people aren't figuring out that they have significant issues until five or ten years. I think the research actually shows it gives an average of eight years. But we're talking, you know, eight to 12 years afterwards because those people need to go back out into the civilian world. They need to try out the short-term tools on their life and fail a lot. They need to get married and get divorced, have kids and not be able to cope with that or have kids and then those kids wind up not liking them very much and wanting to spend time with them. They need to go in debt. They need to go to jail. They need to have cops call on them. They need to have all these negative big life experiences and usually not just one, but many of them consistently so they can see that they are the common denominator. Their thought processes, their thinking processes, their feeling processes, their words and their actions are the common denominator in that pile of shit that is in the wake of their path. 
And of course, there are different strokes for different folks, meaning that these issues tend to present in different ways for different types of people. And two of the main types are this, that if we have this anger and under that is control, desire to control, and under that is fear, that fear kind of shows up in a couple of different main ways in people. One we've discussed at length, which is control and direct action of anger, trying to convince themselves that they're okay, trying to convince themselves that they're worthy, that they're going to accomplish things, that everything's going to be all right. That is the more positive or not positive like good, but positive like outgoing, the more active version. The negative side, which is not bad, as in negative as in bad, it is the repressive side, actually embraces that fear, doesn't try to get to control. They they have a tendency towards more anxiety, actually being able to identify the emotion of fear, and may be more prone to constant panic or worry. So what do we do about this? Nothing moves without awareness, meaning that if we are not aware of some issue or some tendency, then we can't do anything about it. We are blind to it. Therefore, constant reflection is a positive quality. At the end of the day, how did the day go? What emotions are you experiencing? What is going on in your day? Listening to people that are close to you, asking them to be honest with you, or on the opposite side of that, listen to people that don't like you. They may say a lot of different things, and some of that stuff is tr uh, false, but some of that stuff will actually be true. Your enemies can be a huge asset in helping mine your negative qualities, your negative characteristics, because any issue, internal or external, that we have is a reflection of an underdeveloped character trait. So it begs the question, if anger is the issue, what is the opposite quality? Anger is this constant chaos, agitation, irritation, impatience, this immediacy and sense of control, whereas the opposite quality is love in its many and varied forms, which could be patience, kindness, gentleness, sweetness. But also a huge one is inner peace. These people that are tormented by anger and irritation have no inner peace. Many times they cannot stand to be by themselves. They want nothing more than to cut off from the world and be alone. But then when they get alone and maybe they get a little bored, they're unsettled. And it's agitating because that anger internally continues to ring, continues to knock around inside of them. Again, meditation. Meditation is nothing more than mental training or mental and emotional discipline. It is a practice for you to help build the bridge and connect more of yourself to you. You will feel more connected to yourself, and that may be a pretty abstract idea, but if we ha are having a hard time feeling connected and being with other people and crowds and stuff, it is many times one of the one of the issues that has come up is that we have disconnected away from ourselves because we can't cope with what's going on around us and what we've done or what we did or what we have to do or the regiment of crap that we have to maintain to be who and what we are and do what we do. So we simply cut off from ourselves subconsciously and there's this deep void and it feels like nothing is there but yet it's completely filled with junk and we don't know what to do about it, which is why adversity, suffering, and pain are positive tools for self-reflection. We look at what, what and why we're suffering, why we have pain, what the adversity is, because the adversity essentially shows or highlights the underdeveloped character trait, so then we can review what is this problem and adversity about? What is this crisis about? Crises are an opportunity, a major opportunity to learn a lot and advance personally, have a lot of personal growth really, really fast. We just have to look for the lesson. And many times that adversity is produced out of default tendencies, subconscious programs that are being triggered and we are being more reactionary. And once we reflect, we peel apart these layers like we're doing right now and we reprogram our responses because we've grown our awareness. And again, meditation, for example, is a really great vehicle to grow that awareness because it allows us to soak inside of our thoughts, inside of our emotions, and weed out the junk, get rid of it, introduce something new that flushes our mind, flushes our emotions, and allows us to see things more clearly because we're gaining mental discipline because meditation is the process of training the mind, training the emotions. And a huge tool that I use is energy healing. 
And the reason why is because for years I would sit with people and peel back these layers and discover these things that I've delivered in 20 minutes or so that literally took years to unpack and figure out over thousands of veterans, thousands of hours, thousands of conversations. We're able to target those things by interacting with the subconscious mind and the energy of a person and figure out even physiologically where those issues are stored. There's a ton of research dating back to even the 1990s where trauma, tension, negative attitudes, negative subconscious programs are actually tracked physiologically to be held in certain parts of the nervous system and physical body and organ system and even affect the glands, the endocrine system. Because of course, our thoughts and our emotions and our attitudes are nothing more than hormonal secretions. So the quality of our hormonal secretions are the quality of our mind, are the quality of our thoughts, are the quality of our emotions. So all of these qualities coalesce and interact into a really weak system, a really weak physical body, mind and emotions, or a really strong system. And if these programs and issues are stored at this subconscious energetic nervous system level, then that is a fantastic and perfect place to start by tearing them apart. So that internal mountain that we have to summit essentially to conquer this problem, we can turn more into a hill and right that ship and get headed in the opposite direction and get greater success, more permanent success, more complete success faster. And again, I have a military and policing background. Energy healing does seem airy-fairy to me, but there are modalities out there, one of which called pranic healing is a protocol-based system. Systematically, you are able to sort out what's going on, where it's going on. You're able to take baselines of healthy things and then measure against that baseline for unhealthy things and then begin to track what is going on, where is it going on, and then why is it going on. You're able to remove those tendencies and even backfill them with the opposite quality to again accelerate that healing process, which is removing the negative tendency, replacing it with its opposite quality, strengthening the character, and then doing massive action out in your life to help drive that tendency, that new tendency, even deeper. In the beginning, truthfully, I shied away from presenting on energy healing or even meditation with veterans because as strong and brave as veterans suppose themselves to be, they can have a tendency to be pretty close-minded when it has to do with things that are less tangible. But for me, I was once in a place where I was in so much pain, I didn't care what worked, so I just started trying a bunch of different things. These energy healing principles, especially again, pranic healing, produced massive change really fast right away. And a lot of it in the beginning, especially for me, was physical. So therefore, my mind couldn't rationalize it away. I would go in and, and have a, a session and I would go in one way and I would leave literally a different way physiologically. I had a lot of GI issues. So it was a ripe ground to heal and fix some stuff. Over time... I would see veterans either individually or in group, and I just didn't know what to do. The, the top-down approach of using cognitive and cognitive therapy of adjusting our attitudes that will then trickle down into our subconscious mind and control our reactions and tendencies seemed to have little effect. As much as cerebral as I am and as much as I want cognitive therapy to work, it is just one piece of the pie and maybe a smaller piece of the pie than we think. Whereas it's called the, the bottom-up approach, looking at the physical body seems to be the approach that is favored, especially with trauma, which is why there's a lot of evidence-based research around yoga and its profound effect on things like PTSD, because when you start stretching and breathing, you're actually loosening up the nervous system, which is loosening up those stuck and blocked energies which are inhibiting the organ systems, your thoughts and emotions, your ability to respond versus react. So I just ripped off the band-aid and started trying it and had massive results and it's become my obsession and I've seen how powerful it is, which is of course why we are here because I am here 
to give testimony to that, but also to help frame it in a way that is more realistic and relatable to these subgroups, especially veterans, because this shit works and it is powerful and it is immediate and the proof is in the pudding. Have your biases, but at least have an open mind and give it a try because the results will astound you. So that's it. The takeaways, reflect, grow your awareness, start being curious about meditation, find meditation groups that produce results. Also look at energy healing, especially pranic healing, but there's a lot of stuff out there and they do work. Just make sure you are finding a person, a practitioner that is reputable, that can produce consistent results. How do you do that? You ask around. Be simple, be practical, ask a lot of questions. Because the only real way you're going to be able to confirm or deny something is not whether it's popular in American culture or whether there's evidence-based research around it. It's through your personal experience. You have to be real with yourself. You gotta go try it. You've gotta reflect on it. Did that help you or did that not help you? If it didn't, maybe you need to find a different, better practitioner or try a different modality. Look at the track record of the person you're considering working with. Do they produce results? Do they? If they do, take what they're saying as a hypothesis. Don't buy what I'm saying or anybody else says hook, line, and sinker and just parade around with that message, but take it as a general hypothesis and test out that hypothesis in your life. Try it out, learn some principles, try out some techniques and protocols, go have a session with somebody and then be radically honest with yourself. Did it add value? And does that person or group that you're going to have a plan? Be real, be honest. Also, you can get off autopilot, get off of that default mode and live life on purpose.